Hello everyone, and welcome back to the series on differential equations. Today we're going to be revisiting a topic that we introduced when we were first talking about how to solve differential equations with Laplace transforms, and that function was known as the unit impulse function. And some people will also describe it instead as the direct delta distribution. The reason they call it a direct delta distribution instead of a direct delta function is because the output for the direct delta object has positive infinity when x is equal to zero and zero otherwise. And positive infinity is not defined as a real number. Some people will call it an extended real number, uh, but nonetheless it's not really a function in the classical sense. So a lot of people will refer to it as the Dirac delta distribution instead. Right? So this is how we presented its definition uh, when we first introduced the idea that delta x equals infinity for x equals zero and zero otherwise. But now what I want to do is introduce another definition that is a little bit more useful. Once we go through the definition, we'll go through a couple more properties of the Dirac delta distribution, um, go through another function that's very closely related to Dirac delta, and also go through an application of, a, of the Dirac delta function as well. So the definition that we're going to be working with today uh, is a limit definition, and it says the following, that delta of x will be defined to be equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And some people will also say the limit is epsilon goes to zero from the right of one divided by epsilon times the square root of pi times e to the power minus x divided by epsilon the quantity squared. So if you've ever taken any course on probability distributions, you should recognize this object as a Gaussian function. And if you don't know what a Gaussian function is, you may have heard of the bell curve if you have studied any realm of statistics, right? So a Gaussian will have that particular shape, right? Um, in particular, it's looking at a mean of zero and its standard deviation is equal to epsilon which is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as epsilon goes to zero, right? So it's a limit of a Gaussian. So that's one way that we can derive or define the Dirac delta distribution. So as our epsilon gets closer and closer to zero, we obviously start with a basic Gaussian, but that Gaussian function gets smaller and smaller and eventually turns into this object that we clearly see um, here which is usually the graph that we usually envision when we think of Dirac Delta. So now notice we call it a Dirac Delta distribution. Um, and obviously we're looking at the Dirac Delta as a limit of Gaussians. So a natural question you may ask yourself is, is this related to probability density functions and probability? Like is the Dirac Delta a probability distribution function? If so, then the area underneath the curve should be equal to one. At least from the definition, you should see that the function is always positive. So as long as the integral from minus infinity to infinity is equal to one, then that would be a probability density. So what is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the Dirac Delta? distribution. So by the definition from the limit perspective of Dirac Delta, that would be equal to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of one divided by epsilon times the square root of pi times e to the power minus x over epsilon, the quantity squared dx. And now let's do some basic calculus. So uh, the first thing to note is that this is an x integral. So one over epsilon squared of pi has nothing to do with it. So that can be factored outside. And we can also use a u substitution on that particular object there. So once we do that, we're going to have what? So u will be equal to x over epsilon, epsilon at constant. So du will be equal to one over epsilon dx, forcing dx to be equal to epsilon du. Also when x belongs to the interval minus infinity to infinity, um, since epsilon is a positive number, if we approach it from the right, uh, that is going to imply that u will also belong to minus infinity to infinity as well. So once we've performed those substitutions, that's going to give us the limit as epsilon approaches zero from the right-hand side. So let's also put right-hand side there. Um, and that's going to be equal to one over epsilon square root of pi times the u integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus u squared and dx now has the form epsilon du. 
So performing some cancellations, we see that epsilon is going to eliminate there, just leaving us with this integral that does not have u, or does not have epsilon in it, so that's a constant as far as the limit is concerned. So that means this is just going to be equal to uh, 1 over the square root of pi times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus u squared du. And this is a very famous Gaussian integral that you can evaluate via a variety of ways, polar coordinates uh, probably being one of the most common ways to do it. But you should be able to show that that is just equal to the square root of pi. And 1 over square root of pi times square root of pi is just equal to 1. So therefore, since the integral from minus infinity to infinity of direct delta distribution is equal to 1, and we also have that direct delta is greater than 0 for all x inside of the domain of this function, then we have that delta is a probability, probability density function, right? So some people also say a probability density distribution function, right? So we definitely have that delta is associated to some realm of probability theory. Now let's build another very important property associated to direct delta. So let's assume firstly that f is any smooth function on the closed interval alpha beta. Let's assume that a is some point on the interior of that closed interval. And let's assume that f of x is equal to zero outside of that closed interval. Some people also say that f has a compact support. So let's look at a particular integral. So if we take the integral from mass infinity to infinity of that smooth function f of x, multiply by the direct delta distribution evaluated at x minus a, so a shifted version of direct delta, dx, what would we have? So if we look at this from the limit definition, what will it be? So this is going to be, at least by definition, the limit as epsilon approaches zero from the right of the integral from mass infinity to infinity of f of x times, and then the definition of delta x minus a, so that's going to be equal to 1 over epsilon times the square root of pi times e to the minus x minus a over epsilon to quantity squared. So if you're familiar with statistics and probability, now it looks like an actual normal distribution whose mean is equal to a. All right, so the mean for this is going to be equal to a. Again, the standard deviation will be equal to epsilon, which is going to get smaller and smaller. All right. So what can we say about this particular object. Keep in mind, f is arbitrarily smooth on this particular interval, alpha, beta, and out a belongs to the interior of the closed interval, alpha, beta. So what does that mean in terms of this product, f of x times that Gaussian and outside? So keep in mind, since this Gaussian is centered at a, and let's assume that this is, say, a plus some really small number h, and that's a minus another really small number h. Outside of this particular interval, this function is practically equal to zero. When I say practically, I mean asymptotically equal to zero, right? So if I multiply f times this function outside that interval, then it's just going to be equal to zero. But if I multiply f times that Gaussian near that interval, what is it going to be equal to? Well, it's going to be equal to just the functional value at a, right? Because x is near a, so f of x is approximately equal to a on that particular interval. So we can write that. So f of x is approximately equal to f of a for all x in a minus h, a plus h, where h is arbitrarily small because f is smooth on that particular interval. At least in the limit, it, it will converge to that particular object. So in continuation, that would be equal to the limit as epsilon approaches zero from the right-hand side. And we can factor f of x plus a if we're focused on that asymptotic interval, and that's just gonna be equal to f of a times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of one over epsilon, the square root of pi, e to the minus x minus a over epsilon, the quantity squared, dx. And we've already mentioned that this particular object is just a normal probability density function, 
So that means the integral is just going to be equal to 1, right? That particular object there. So if that's the particular case, the thing that we're left with actually doesn't depend on epsilon. So that means what? So that means the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x times delta x minus a dx will just be equal to f of a. All right, so it's actually only focused on the point of f for which there's a unit impulse associated to it and everywhere outside of it doesn't contribute to the story. And as a corollary, we can clearly see if a is equal to zero, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x times delta x dx will just be equal to f of a, in this case would be equal to f of zero. And just as a side note, some people will actually take this as the defining property of the direct delta distribution instead of the limit. But technically speaking, you can derive one from the other, depending on sort of what you're taking as axiomatic and what you're taking as sort of uh, corollary. The next function that I want to introduce is known as the heavy side function. And it's just a piecewise linear function as defined here. So h of x will be defined to be equal to 1 for all x that is non-negative and 0 where x is negative. So we have this piecewise linear function. Again, some people will define the heaviside function in a slightly different manner by doing 1 for x positive, 0 for x negative, and 1 half for x equal to 0. Right? If you choose this particular convention, you'll get the same exact result results that I'm about to present, so you won't lose anything here, but some physics applications prefer this convention over the one I have mentioned above, but keep in mind, nothing will affect the results coming after this. So, my first question to you is this. If we have this constant function pretty much for all x, what would you say the derivative of this function is? So the derivative of the heavy side function is equal to what? It's very tempting to say it's equal to the zero function, but this function isn't continuous at x is equal to zero, so it cannot be equal to the zero function. So let's begin by sort of building a very important result that will actually give this result very, very cleverly. So as usual, let's suppose that f is uh, smooth, it's going to be smooth on, again, alpha, beta. Uh, and let's also assume that zero is on the interior of alpha, beta. So before it was a, but now a is going to be chosen to be zero. And let's also assume that f of x will be equal to zero for all x not in alpha, beta. Okay, so let's look at the following integral. In particular, let's look at the integral from minus infinity to infinity of that smooth function times the derivative of the heavy side function dx, right? Which we're trying to figure out, All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use integration by parts. So if we use integration by parts, obviously uh, u will be equal to f of x. So when we say smooth, at least a differentiable is smooth so that the derivative exists. So if u is equal to f of x, that means du will be equal to f prime of x dx. And if we choose u to be f, that means dv will be equal to h prime of x dx, forcing v to be equal to the heavy side function. So once we do that, what will we have? So this is just going to be equal to uv, so f of x, h of x, and that's going to be evaluated as x goes to minus infinity, as x goes to positive infinity, minus the integral from minus infinity to infinity of v du. So that's going to be equal to h of x times f prime of x dx. So keep in mind, f of x it has a compact support. And keep in mind, when we mean compact support, that means it's, you know, nice and smooth on your alpha, beta, zero region. And it's going to be zero everywhere outside of it. So at positive infinity and negative infinity, this particular function is going to be equal to zero. And h of x is going to be equal to 1 over here, and it's going to be 0 over here. So 0 times 0 will be 0, and 1 times 0 will be 0 on the right-hand side. So we get 0 minus 0 for that evaluation, so we're just going to be left with 0. So this is going to be equal to 0 minus the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f prime of x times h of x dx.
So everything is simplifying quite nicely. So remember that h of x is equal to 0 for all x less than 0. So we can simplify this integral bound by doing an integral from 0 to infinity instead. So we can write this as the negative integral from 0 to infinity of f prime of x uh, times h of x dx. And then we can simplify things a little more because what is h of x? So h of x is equal to 1 for all x that is greater than, and also greater than or equal to 0. Um, but keep in mind, if you choose the 1 half uh, value at 0, integrals don't really focus on values at that endpoint. As long as it's arbitrarily close to that endpoint, that's all the integral considers, at least in the Riemann integral approach. So that means this is just going to be equal to minus the integral from 0 to infinity of f prime of x times 1 dx. So that's actually pretty nice. So what is that going to be? So that's going to be equal to, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, minus, so let's write that as the uh, f of x function evaluated as x goes to infinity and as x goes to 0. So keep in mind, f of x is that smooth function on alpha, beta, 0. And it's going to be equal to 0 outside of that region, in particular at x is equal to infinity. So once we plug that in, that's going to give us minus 0 minus f of 0. So that's going to be equal to positive f of 0. Right? So that actually simplifies quite nicely. So the value of this integral depends solely on that smooth function f. So that means we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x h prime of x dx will be equal to f of 0. But also remember that f of 0 will be equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x times delta of x. So if we take as the defining property that this is the defining property for delta, and that is the defining property for h prime, if we equate these two particular integrals, we see that delta and h prime are identical. So that's actually very interesting. So that means that h prime of x, at least in the Riemann integrable sense, will be equal to delta x. Therefore, if somebody says, what's the derivative of the heavy side function? You will say it's the direct delta distribution. So from that, you can also integrate the direct delta distribution. And we can say that the integral of the direct delta distribution would just be equal to the heavy side function plus some arbitrary constant c. Right? Some people will also take this uh, connection uh, to define the heavy side in an integral way. So one can also define the heavy side function h of x uh, to be equal to the integral from minus infinity to x of the direct delta distribution. Right? So one could define the heavy side function instead of a piecewise function, but rather an integral of the direct delta distribution. Right? So that's the connection between these particular objects, right? Now, with that in mind, let's also bring back the Laplace transforms, right? So what was the Laplace transform of the direct delta distribution? Because keep in mind, we're in a series about differential equations, um, and Laplace transforms definitely give us a little bit of light on how to solve them. So what did this come out to be? So by definition of Laplace transforms, that's the integral from zero to infinity of the function of interest, which is direct delta, times e to the minus omega x dx, right? So we can actually look at this function as our function f times our delta function. And notice that a for this particular function is equal to zero. So using that defining property of direct delta, this is actually just going to be equal to e to the minus omega x evaluated at a is equal to zero. So if we plug zero in, that's just going to be e to the minus omega times zero, and that's just going to be equal to one. Now you might be thinking, okay, well that's kind of interesting, the Laplace transform of delta is equal to one, but how can we use this particular object? Keep in mind, delta is equal to zero outside of a neighborhood of x is equal to zero. So I actually can restrict the domain of this exponential function to be practically or identically equal to zero at say three. 
and then I can have some integral interval of compact support for that exponential. So technically this should be a restriction of this exponential to be a little bit more formal, right? But they would give you the same exact results analytically. So those are some of the very interesting properties, at least on the algebraic side, associated to direct delta and heavy side. Now let's go to our primary concern of how to solve differential equations that include direct delta impulse functions. As our guiding example, let's take this very easy first order linear and homogeneous differential equation with this initial condition y of zero is equal to six. Obviously you could go about this with Laplace transforms or integrating factors. We'll go at this problem from both angles, starting with the Laplace transform. So let's take the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation. So that's gonna give us the Laplace transform of y prime plus three times the Laplace transform of y is equal to the Laplace transform of delta x from the linear theory of Laplace transforms. Once we do that, what are we going to get? So the Laplace transform of y prime, remember, is going to be omega times the Laplace transform of y minus the initial condition y is zero. And then we're going to have three times the Laplace transform of y. And it's just proven the Laplace transform of delta x will just be equal to one. So once we group things, in particular that term and that term, and isolate that initial condition, which is six, that's going to give us what? So omega plus three times the Laplace transform of y will be equal to y zero, which is six, plus one, which will be seven. Once we isolate our omega plus three term, we're gonna have the Laplace transform of y will be equal to seven over omega plus three. And that structure you should easily identify as the inverse or the Laplace transform of an exponential function with rate parameter minus three. That is our solution to our differential equation should be equal to seven e to the minus three x. And that's it. Now, if you're not very careful, you should be verifying that your initial condition at least satisfies that. Moreover, it should satisfy the original differential equation. So if we actually look at the initial condition, y zero, what you're actually going to see is we're gonna have seven times e to the minus three times zero is equal to seven times one, which is seven. But our initial condition, which was set to be six, doesn't match. And that's kind of problematic, right? And notice that we didn't do any errors there, but they don't match, right? So that means this is not our solution. So what went wrong? So one very interesting thing about Laplace transforms is that they're integral transforms. And if you know anything about integral transforms, integral transforms, integral transforms, are not local operators. When I say local operators, for example, for derivatives, they look at a particular point of interest, but integrals look over a particular range. So when you have non-local operators, they do not consider local instantaneous features. In case you're not convinced of what that actually means, consider the area under a curve, which our integrals are typically built for. So for example, if I have this particular curve here, and I want to ask you to find the area from A to B, you would say that, oh, I know how to find that. I would just integrate under this curve and I would get this particular shape. But what if I instead put a removable discontinuity at this particular point and then define that point above? You should note that the area actually stays the same because I can partition this using improper integrals from the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B, and you'll get the same exact geometric area, right? Because you'll get the same exact area, but it doesn't consider what's actually going on at this particular point C. So when it comes to direct delta distributions in terms of differential equations, Laplace transforms don't, at least on the surface or naturally, pick up on those particular things. So still, we have this differential equation and we seek to solve it. So how are we going to solve it? So solution, I should say solution number two, but the first one isn't actually the solution. So I'm just gonna say the solution smiley face. So again, let's revisit our differential equation, y prime plus three y is equal to delta x. And again, we need to solve this initial condition, y zero is equal to six. So as previously mentioned, this is a first order linear inhomogeneous differential equations. So using integrating factors might work here. 
So our integrating factor, f of x, will be equal to e to the integral of the function in front of y, which is just going to be equal to 3, so that's going to be equal to e to the 3x. Once we multiply both sides by that integrating factor, what are we going to get? So that's going to give us e to the 3x times y prime, plus 3e to the 3x times y, and that's going to be equal to delta x times e to the 3x. Right? Now, something very, very interesting here. Delta x times e to the x is equal to what? Well, outside of x is equal to 0, delta x is just equal to 0. And when x is equal to 0, e to the 3x is just equal to 1. And 1 times infinity will just be infinity. So the right-hand side in this particular case is still just delta x, which is actually kind of interesting. So once I rewrite the left-hand side using an inverse product rule, that's just going to be equal to the derivative of e to the 3x times y which will just be equal to our direct delta distribution, all right? So now all we need to do is just integrate both sides. So once I integrate both sides, I'm gonna have e to the three x times y, and that's gonna be equal to the integral of the direct delta distribution, which is just gonna be equal to c plus the heavy side function, h of x, all right? So now we have this heavy side function, which considers that initial trigger at x is equal to zero, that jump or that change in behavior from x negative to x positive. So now I'm going to use my initial condition, y is zero is equal to six, and see what that c should be. Or you could isolate for y and then do it there, it actually doesn't matter. So e to the zero will be one and y will be six. So we're gonna have six is gonna be equal to c plus the heavy side evaluated at zero, which is just gonna be equal to what? That's just gonna be equal to one. Right, so we're going to have c plus 1. Here, if you define it to be equal to the half, it won't work. So this is one of the reasons why I prefer, from the differential equation perspective, to define the initial condition for heavy side at 0 to be 1. So if we isolate this particular object, we're going to have that our constant will be equal to 5. So once you combine these two lines, we should have our solution. So rewriting, we're going to have y of x will be equal to e to the minus 3x times our heavy side function h of x plus our constant 5 and this is the claimed solution which is definitely a lot different than the one we got with Laplace transforms so is it really our solution well let's check out the derivative and make sure that works so if we have this function let's take the derivative of it so when I differentiate we can use a product rule so we're going to do the first times the derivative of the second. Derivative of heavy side will be delta plus zero. And then plus that one, h of x plus five, times the derivative of e to the minus three x will be minus three times e to the minus three x. So once we have that, what are we going to have? So keep in mind, e to the minus three x times h x plus five is just y. h x plus five is there, e to the minus three x is there, so there's our y as well. So we have that y prime will be equal to e to the minus 3x times delta x, and then plus minus 3 times y. So I can add 3 to both sides. So I'm going to have y prime plus 3y will be equal to e to the minus 3x times delta x. But keep in mind, e to the minus 3x times delta x is still just delta x. So we have that y prime plus 3y will be equal to delta x, which is the original differential equation. And also I'd leave for you to verify that the initial condition y0 is equal to 6 for this particular solution. So using integrating factors and the knowledge about heavy side and delta's relationship does give us the precise solution for this impulse differential equation. Now let's look at an actual real life example of where the unit impulse can come up in application. Let's consider an application in the realm of physics. In particular, consider a mass spring system without dampening with the mass initially at rest. At time t is equal to zero, an instantaneous force is applied to that mass. Let's suppose that x of t represents the displacement of the mass at time t. If you know anything about mass spring systems, you should know that the general structure of the mass spring system in terms of a differential equation typically comes in the form m times x double prime plus kx is equal to usually zero. Here, m represents the mass 
And this k corresponds to what some people usually refer to as the spring constant. It's the ability for that spring to resonate. That's one of the interpretations of that constant k. But now, instead of it being set equal to zero, we have some instantaneous force being applied. So one can actually show that the right location in this differential equation will be equal to F0 times delta of t. Right Here, this F0 is the initial, initial instantaneous force instantaneous force and that delta is associated to that word instantaneous right so this is our differential equation so what type of differential equation is this so we can sort of start talking about strategies to solve it well this is obviously a constant coefficient it's a constant coefficient second order linear in homogeneous ordinary differential equation. All right, and keep in mind, we're assuming it's at rest and let's assume its initial position is zero. Uh, the instant before the instantaneous force is applied. So we can represent that formally with the initial conditions. Uh, X zero minus is equal to zero and X prime zero minus will also be equal to zero. So this notation, zero minus, is the instant before zero, All right? So let's first off start by solving the associated homogeneous equation on the left-hand side, mx double prime plus kx is equal to zero. So once we do that, if we replace x with our associated exponential guess, e to the lambda x, what you're actually going to have is you're just gonna have m lambda squared plus k will be equal to zero. So once we subtract and solve for lambda squared, we're gonna have lambda squared will be equal to minus k over m, and then take the square roots of both sides and introducing i for complex numbers, we're gonna have lambda will be equal to plus or minus, let's do i here, and then the square root of k over m. Right, so that means when we do exponentials with regards to pure imaginary numbers, that means we're gonna have a sine function and a cosine function whose angular frequency depends on the square root of k over m term. So that means once we work out that Euler formula and the simplification and the renaming of our arbitrary constants, the homogeneous solution x h of t will be equal to c1 times the cosine of the square root of k over m t and then, and keep in mind, t is not under the square root, and then c2 times the sine of the square root of k over m t. Right. So that would be our general homogeneous differential equation. So now let's target our particular solution. So our particular solution, our guess for that, xpt, is going to be a form of a product rule. In particular, we're going to have an at times h of t guess, that's gonna give us our heavy side function and also its derivative once we uh, take the derivative of that, which will be a unit impulse function. And then we're gonna equate both sides of this differential equation to sort of see um, what that constant a should be. There's also some physical implement implications associated to this guess as well, for which I won't get into here. So once I assume this is our particular guess, x p prime of t will be equal to what? So we're gonna do first, times the derivative of the second. So first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So a times h of t. So that's our first derivative. And now let's do our second derivative. So we need to do product rule twice. So x double prime particular t p t will be equal to what? So again, I'm going to do first times derivative of the second. Let's actually do this one first, because this is a little bit easier. For the first times the derivative of the second plus, actually, no, that's not a product rule. That's just a constant times h of t. So that's actually all of that. So now let's do this derivative uh, now, since that's a product rule. So we're gonna have, again, our a times h of t. So first times the derivative of the second plus the second derivative first. So what is that going to be? So we're gonna have our at times the derivative of our direct delta function. 
So the derivative of direct delta, so it's not an integral which would be heavy side, it's the derivative of it. So what would that be? So to sort of give you some enlightenment about the derivatives of direct delta, because keep in mind from the limiting perspective, the direct delta is just a limit of a Gaussian. So if we take the derivative, so if this is delta in its non-limited form, and we take the derivative of it, its derivative would actually look something like this particular object, right? So as epsilon gets close to zero for this particular object, what you're actually going to see is this minimum is gonna go down to negative infinity, this maximum is gonna go up to positive infinity. So what you're actually going to see is that delta prime x would be equal to, at least in the piecewise sense, both plus or minus infinity at x is equal to zero and zero for x not equal to zero. So delta function wasn't really a function because this infinity thing, now it's equal to two things at x is equal to zero. So it's even more strange, right? But it's that's pretty much what the derivative of the direct delta function is. So, you know, you can also consider what about the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on. Um, but I'll leave that for you to explore on your own. So before we proceed, let's make sure we didn't do anything crazy here. So we have our a times the derivative of h of t, so that's our a delta t. And then we have the derivative of a times t delta t. So that's going to be equal to a t times the derivative of delta t, which is delta prime t. And then we're going to have delta and then delta t times the derivative of t, which is 1. So actually this h of t should be equal to a delta t. So let's just go ahead and fix that. So that should be a delta t. Right. So once we have that fixed up, these actually will combine quite nicely. So we can write that as instead, let's write that as 2a delta t plus a t delta prime t. And that's xp double prime of t. So now we have our x double prime, we have our x prime, and we have our constant term. So we can substitute these back into our differential equation, uh, compare both sides, and then proceed onwards. So we're going to have m times our second derivative, which is going to be 2a delta t plus a t delta prime t. So that's m x double prime, and then plus k times our x and our x was assumed to be a t times h of t. And that's gonna be equal to the right-hand side, our homogeneous term, which is gonna be f zero delta of t. So now we're going to equate coefficients of our deltas. So on the left-hand side, we have an m a delta t, uh, and that's gonna be associated to our f zero. We don't have any delta prime t's on the right hand side and we also don't have any h's either so that's going to be zero h of t as well because keep in mind this has to be true for all t so the only term that we actually care about is that term and that term so once we equate coefficients we're going to have 2 m a delta t will be equal to f zero delta t which means that a must be equal to f0 all over 2m. So that is our coefficient for our inhomogeneous portion of our solution, aka our particular. So that means our particular solution will be equal to our f0 all over 2m times t times our heavy side function. Right? So keep in mind, in order to get the general solution, all you have to do is take your uh, homogeneous term, add that to your particular term, and that gives you your general solution for your higher order and homogeneous differential equation, right? So that means our solution, x of t, will be equal to c1 times, let's bring everything back, so the square root of k over m t plus c2 times the sine of the square root of k over m t plus our particular f0 all over 2m t times our heavy side function, all right? So now we need to figure out what these constants, x is, uh, x1 or c1 and c2 are gonna be equal to. So let's start off with our x0 minus is equal to zero. So when we plug in zero for x into this particular object, 
what do we see? And keep in mind, when t is equal to 0, x is equal to 0. So what are we going to have? So we're going to have that, so when t is equal to 0, um, that's going to be equal to 1. That's going to be equal to 0. This is going to be equal to 0, and that's going to be equal to 0. So then you're going to have c1 times 1, which is c1, is going to be equal to 0. So we clearly see that c1 will be equal to 0 from that particular initial condition. right? So once we have that particular thing, let's look at x prime of t, um, and then use our second initial condition to sort of figure out what c2 is. So x prime of t will be equal to, so the of cosine is minus sine, so we're going to have minus c1 square root of k over m times the sine of the square root of k over mt. Derivative of sine is cosine, so we're going to have c2 times the square root of c k over m times the cosine of the square root of k over mt. And the derivative of f0 over tm times t times h of t will be equal to some constant f0 over 2m times a product rule. So it's going to be first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, and keep in mind the derivative of heavy side will be equal to delta. So we have this particular object. So keep in mind x prime of zero minus will also be equal to zero since it's at rest. So when we have that, we're gonna have zero will be equal to, so sine of zero will be equal to zero, and then plus cosine of zero will be equal to one. So we're gonna have c2 square root of k over m, and over here, we're going to have 0. So we're going to have f0 all over 2m times 0 plus the heavy side of 0 will be equal to 1. So we have this particular equation. So we have that c2 times the square root of k over m plus f0 all over 2m must be equal to 0. So we can isolate that. So that's going to be c2 will be equal to minus f0 all over 2m times the square root of m over k, All right? Uh, we have two square roots of m's on the bottom, so they can actually cancel out. So once you play around with your radicals, we have that c2 will be equal to minus f0 all over two square root of mk, All right? So now we have our c1, we have our c2. That means we have the general solution for this physics problem. So our final solution, x of t, will be equal to minus f0, that initial uh, instantaneous uh, impulse force, times 2 times the square root of mk, times the sine of the square root of k over m, our angular frequency, times t, and then plus this f0 all over 2m times t times h of t, which is taken into account the effect um, after that unit impulse has taken place. All right, and that's our final solution. So those are some of the basics uh, associated to the Dirac delta function or Dirac delta distribution. It's familiar cousin, AKA it's antiderivative, the heavy side function, um, and some applications uh, and theoretical properties associated to it. Um, just in case you were ever curious about how to use this in real life. Hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.